Now, friends, we come to the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians, and we come now to that chapter that we've labeled God's comfort in all circumstances of the ministry of Christ. And we have set before us here the requirements of a good minister of Jesus Christ. And none of us can read this without saying again who is sufficient for these things. None of us could meet this high standard. We'll be looking at that, but I want you to notice that we're still in the section of God's comfort. The comfort of God, chapters 1 through 7. And we've been now in God's comfort in the ministry of suffering. First, it was God's comfort in the glorious ministry of Christ, chapter 3. Then in the ministry of suffering for Christ, the ministry of martyrdom for Christ. And now God's comfort in all circumstances of the ministry of Christ, the all-round minister. Let's look at this for just a moment, and we see presented to us here the one who is an ideal minister. Now, let me read. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, you will notice that in your translation that with him is in italics. And it should be, we then as workers together. And we need to recognize that there's another line that is made today that needs to be rubbed out. And that is the line between clergy and laity. There are certain ones given the gift of teaching. And if I have any gift, it would have to be that, because if I can't claim that one, I don't have any. But the thing is that there are those that are called to teach and those to be pastors, those to be missionaries. And then there are others that are called into a relationship. They're all given a gift, but we would term that the laity, the pulpit and the pew. And they ought not to be the distinction that we make between the two. We're workers together. If you're sitting in the pew, if you are listening today, you're as responsible to get out the Word of God as I am. I've just probably been given a little different gift, but you may be today a bank president, and you may be the president of a large corporation. You may be a truck driver. Or you may be just a housewife. But honestly, you're responsible to get the Word of God out. The fact of the matter is, we today need to recognize God's given to the church certain men that will teach, certain men that will act as pastors, certain men that have other gifts that are used for the work of the ministry. That is, to equip the believers to serve. Now, let me again repeat this, because it came to me some time ago from a very good friend of mine, Dr. Earl Rodmacher, up here in Portland, Oregon. He's president of the Western Baptist Seminary, I think one of the coming men of the country today. And he made this statement. He said, shepherds do not produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. A great many people think the preacher is to win all the people for Christ. That's his business, or the evangelist. May I say to you, that's your business. God has given teachers and preachers and evangelists and missionaries, all of these, to fill out and prepare the body of believers, that is, those that are the ministry, and the ministry of those sitting in the pew, that they might be equipped to go out and witness. The shepherd, you see, doesn't produce the sheep. He feeds sheep, and he watches over sheep. He shepherds sheep, but he doesn't produce sheep. He can't. The sheep produce sheep. And today the whole work of the church is bogged down because the sheep are not out witnessing. They are the ones that should be out witnessing today. And I want to raise the question again. I'm being very personal these past few times. What are you doing today to get the Word of God to others? Now, actually, there's some of you that can do something that I can't do and no preacher in the country can do 
You know what that is? There's some people got confidence in you, and they wouldn't listen to me five seconds, but they will listen to you. Maybe you could get a few of the logs of our program given out to your friend. A word from you would cause them to listen. And we find that there are people being led to Christ today because somebody talked to them about listening to the program. And I know that there are some folk that will put an ad in their local paper. We are not able to do that. That's not our method. But we found out that that happens. And I hear from time to time of so many things that people are doing to get people to listen to the Word. I know one man, he's a very fine businessman. Honestly, he can't speak. That is, oh, I mean, he can talk, but he has got some sort of an impediment. And he gets the tapes, and he's circulating them everywhere today, and he'll take them around. And he's a prominent businessman, and it's quite flattering for him to knock on the door of maybe one of his workers one evening and bring a tape and bring a machine that plays it, comes in and visits and said, just like you listen to this. And believe me, I guess that's subjecting them to a great deal of torture, but it's sure witnessing. You see, friends, we're workers together. We're workers together. And he says, I beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, how do you receive the grace of God in vain? Well, this is the way. What response are we making today to the love of his heart? God today has been showering his goodness and his mercy on us. And to receive his great goodness and to rejoice in the salvation of the grace of God and yet to live carnal, worldly lives, that's what it means to receive the grace of God in vain. That is something that we need to recognize. It's important to see that. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, I have helped thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, a great many people, they say, well, I won't accept Christ now. I will do it some other time. They'll postpone it. And a great many folk like to say this, well, I'm going to wait till a certain evangelist comes to town. And there are a lot of people do that. Many pastors have told me that. Or I'm going to wait until we have a meeting. Now, I don't know who you are, where you are, how you are right now. But if you're not saved and you're listening, for you, now is the accepted time, right now. Not tomorrow, not when you hear some greater preacher or hear some great message. We're just listening right now. Now is the accepted time. Right now. I don't know what time it is when you're listening to this program because all of our stations, it's different. But you look at your clock. Whatever time that clock says, that's it. That's the time for you. Now is the accepted time. Well, somebody says, can I accept it tomorrow? Well, yes, but you have no promise of it. But the important thing is, God says it's right now. And it's not now and never, but right now. Now, will you notice, he says, "...giving no offense," this is verse 3, "...in anything that the ministry be not blamed." Now, we need to be very careful of our personal behavior. "...giving no offense in anything." Now, offense here doesn't mean hurting people's feelings. I do not believe that any pastor today can serve long in a church without hurting the feelings of someone. Some folk are there for no other purpose than to get their feelings hurt. Actually, you can't be pastor of a church long until somebody gets their feelings hurt. You know, you hear the old saying, they carry their feelings on their sleeve. Well, a lot of the saints do. And it goes something like this. If you do not shake hands with them, you probably intended to slight them. If you do, you hurt them forgetting that they got rheumatism or arthritis. And if you stop to speak with them, you're interrupting them. But if you do not, well, you're being proud <laughs> and you're being a little snooty. And if you write them a letter, 
Well, they know that you're after their money. And if you do not, well, you're neglecting them. And if you visit them, you're just bothering them, hindering them from their work. And if you do not, well, it shows you don't have any interest in your church members. It's impossible, my friend, to please them all. Down in a little restaurant in West Texas, and I forget the name of the town, my wife and I stopped there early one morning for breakfast. We'd driven, I think, 200 miles that morning, and we were hungry, and we went in, and it was just a little dumpy place, but I had a good Texas breakfast, I can tell you that, including grits and hot biscuits. And when I went to pay the bill, there was a sign up there, and I'll never forget it. Maybe many of you have seen it many times, but it was new to me that morning, and it made my day. It said, you can't please everybody, but we try. I think many pastors probably ought to put that on their steady door, or even maybe at their home. We can't please everybody, but we try. Now, he has three sets of nine different things that should characterize the ministry. And they're quite interesting. And I'm probably going to move through this rather hurriedly. Will you notice what he says here? Verse 4 now, "...but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God." Now, how do we do that? In much patience. That's number one, in much patience. And believe me, that bowled me over to the very first one. And I'll be very frank to admit to you, that's something I've always lacked. And my wife says to me, and my best friends say this to me, Vernon McGee, if you ever preach a sermon on patience, I'm going to walk out, because I don't think you're the fellow to speak on patience. So you know what? In case some of them are listening, I'm not going to talk on patience. But that's number one here. In second, in afflictions. That is something that a great many men today in the ministry have to bear. And I'm of the opinion that most know what we're talking about in necessities. A great many folk who didn't come through the Depression or were born in a poor home. I've seen the time when I was a boy that there was not one dollar bill in my home. And if it hadn't been for the fact the grocer would sell us grocers on credit, we would have gone hungry. Many a time I've had nothing in the world for supper, the evening meal but just a glass of sweet milk, and we'd crumble biscuits, cold biscuits in it. And do you want to know something? I still think that's good. That's better than a lot of French pastry, and I think it'd be lots better for me if I tried more of it. But every now and then, I crumble an old biscuit when I can get one in some cold, sweet milk. And friends, that's really angel food, let me tell you. But some of us know about that. Others more than others. Dr. Ironside tells about the time that as a young preacher, he preached one time in a place three days and didn't have a thing to eat in that three days. He says that he was preaching to a group of people that thought that Dr. Ironside was living by faith, and they sure did let him do it. So nothing came in for food. And then one morning, he was debating whether to stay in bed for breakfast or to tighten up his belt again for breakfast. But he noticed a letter being slipped on the door. And he got up and opened it. And all it said was an expression of Christian fellowship. And there was a $10 bill in it. And he said that morning, he went out and had the best breakfast he ever had in his life. Well, there are a great many men today know what afflictions are. But this new generation, they don't know. That's what's made the generation gap. When I try to tell my daughter, even though she's married, about the depression, she says, Dad, I don't even know what you're talking about. And they don't. In afflictions and in necessities and in distresses and in stripes. And I have a notion very few of us know what physical stripes are, but my, we've been cut across the face many times by some insulting remark made by some pious saint that makes it in a very pious voice, you know. The very interesting thing was that I used to have a dear lady, and she had a sharp tongue, 
And she would always go out of an evening, after the evening service, and she'd say to me, Pastor, you had a wonderful service this morning, a wonderful sermon this morning. Well, what about the evening sermon? And I told a friend of mine, I said, according to her, I can preach a good sermon in the morning, but I can't preach a good one at night. That was a nice way, you see, and a very pious way. She had a saying to me, Preacher, get with it. You're not doing so well of a Sunday evening. That's the way some, you know, hit a minister across the face. And then we have here in labors and tumults and in imprisonments and in watchings and in fastings. Now, those are nine things there, my friend, that should be the thing that would identify the minister. Maybe not all of them. But certainly most ministers know what most of these things mean. Now we have a second set of nines. Number one is by pureness. And believe me, it's important that a minister be pure in his life. There's one thing that hurts the ministry today, the fact when one minister turns up as a bad egg, and when he does, and found guilty of immorality, it hurts the ministry. Pureness is important, and it's still not old-fashioned. You may be a square. I may be a square for saying it, but it's still good. And by knowledge, and knowledge here, I think, means not only the Word of God, but also preachers should know a great many things. He should, I think, keep himself abreast of the times in which he lives by knowledge and by long-suffering. And here that comes up again. Long-suffering is patience, just in another suit of clothes. By kindness and by the Holy Spirit, and God have mercy on any of us preachers who try to preach without the Spirit of God leading us and guiding us. That's the thing I'm more concerned about than anything else. And in the 21 years I was pastor in downtown Los Angeles, I followed many great men. And I always thought of Dr. Tari, the great evangelist of the past, who was the first pastor of that church. And when I would go out, the last thing I would say, Oh, Lord, this morning, help me to preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Vernon McGee by himself, friends, isn't very much, and not compared to those men. But by the Holy Spirit, and then by love unfeigned, And this is something today that's needed, a love that's genuine, not pious pretenders quoting pious platitudes and these phony professors of faith, always telling you how much they love you and then put a knife in your back. And we've got a lot of so-called saints and their ministers like that today. Love unfeigned, genuine, real, because the Spirit of God put it in our hearts. Oh, this is so important we're talking about. And by the word of truth, and that word of truth means the preacher ought to know his Bible. And then we go on down and we read by the power of God. And that's important. And by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Well, you notice we come now to another set here. And this is the third set of nines, by honor and dishonor. I would say this gives us a well-balanced ministry, honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. Some people are going to say some ugly things about you, but we're to serve, not recognizing that. In other words, a good report can hurt you. Shakespeare has one of his characters say, my Friends flatter me, and they cause me to make an ass of myself. And my enemies, they call me an ass, which is the worst. And we have here in evil report and good report. There are those that flatter us, those that say ugly things about us. And as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known. Oh, my minister God today may not be well known, as dying and behold we live, (laughs) as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich. 
Anytime you find a preacher that's rich, watch out. We're not supposed to get rich in the ministry. But having nothing, yet possessing all things. You remember Paul said in the first epistle, all things are ours. Christ is ours. Everything is ours today. I'm rich, but I'm poor too. Oh, you don't know how poor I am. Now will you notice, and yet possessing all things. And then Paul just cries out here, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Oh, how Paul yearned over these converts of his in Corinth, these little baby Christians, babes in Christ, carnal Christians, but his heart went out to them. He almost breaks in this chapter and in the next one. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own being. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Be ye also enlarged. And what he's doing here is, is just opening up his great heart of love here. And he stirs up the hearts here of those that love him. But the interesting thing is, he apparently stirs up the hearts of those who hate God and hate his word to work injury upon those who love him and love the Scriptures. Now, we find that was true in the early history of the church. And it's true today. You stand for God, and you will find that it'll really cost you something. There's no question about that. Now, he begins to talk about something that's quite important, and yet here's a section that probably has been abused more, and there are some that have interpreted and made it as hard as nails, unyielding, unloving, and yet what Paul is saying is coming from a tender heart of a man whose heart was breaking and a great concern for these folks. And I want you to notice this because I think it's very important to see. He says here, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness. And we find here that this is something that is rather abused today. And if you even walk past a liberal church, why, somebody's going to say that you're unequally yoked together with unbelievers. May I say to you that actually what he's talking about here is this matter of worldliness that's in the world and also these sins of the flesh. There's so many so-called separated believers that are probably as worldly as they possibly can be. Now, back in the Old Testament on the Mosaic Law, God gave a law to his people who were engaged largely in agriculture, and he said to them, Be ye not unequally yoked together. That's what Paul says here, and he's referring back to the Mosaic Law where God says, You shall not yoke an ox and an ass together. Well, one is a clean animal and the other is a unclean animal. And how are you yoked together? Well, you're yoked together, my friend, in a long enterprise. And it's a very real union that is brought about. It's a relationship. May I make a distinction here? Because I find this made today by a great many. This has to do with joining in maybe some local enterprise. May I say to you that It hasn't anything in the world to do with that, but it has to do with joining up in a permanent relationship. Now, how can you be yoked together? Well, marriage is one. An unbeliever and a believer should not marry. Clean animal and an unclean should not be joined together. And I don't think they should be joined together. For instance, let me use this as an illustration. Here is a man that's a professor in a seminary, and the seminary has gone liberal. 
But he is professing that he's a conservative, that he still believes the great truth. Now, I think that man should get out and away from that seminary because he's drawing a salary there. To all intents and purposes, he's permanently identified with that work and with that organization. He's associated with it in a very tangible, real way. Now, that's one thing. Now, suppose, though, that an evangelist comes to town, holds a meeting, and maybe he uses certain methods that we would not condone at all. We'd not approve of them. But may I say to you, he's preaching Christ, and God's blessing his ministry. Well, are you not to join with him? It's just going to be for two, three weeks, and it's not a permanent sort of thing. Now, I remember when I was pastor in Nashville, we had an evangelist that came to town when without saying a word to any of us that were conservative men, he put his tent right across from my church and the Baptist church in that end of the city. And he came over then to solicit our help. Well, I was rather reluctant because of the ethics of the man. And I found out he was really a screwball and many ways. He could conduct the most informal service I've ever heard. He could be halfway through his sermon, and he'd stop and say, well, I forgot to make this announcement. I forgot to take the offering. Stop his sermon, he'd take the offering. Well, if you've forgotten it, I guess that's the thing to do. But he was very informal. And as I say, I'd call him a screwball. And a Baptist preacher and I, we talked it over. He and I were good friends. We were conservative. And so we decided we'd support him. He was going to be there about a couple of weeks, and we supported him. People were saved, friends, no question about that. I wouldn't join with him permanently. I wouldn't be identified as that man permanently for anything in the world. But I see nothing wrong in just maybe one or two weeks. Now, I want you to know how Paul did it. Paul would go to a city. Where did he go? Why, he went to the synagogue. Now, can you imagine a place? That would be more in opposition to Jesus Christ than the synagogue. But that's where Paul began. But now wait, and I'm not condemning him for it. I think that's the way he should have done it. That's the way God led him. But if Paul had joined one of those synagogues and had become the rabbi in one of them and stayed there, I'll be honest with you, I'm afraid I'd have some questions. You see, there's a difference in this. It's one thing to be yoked together in a permanent arrangement like marriage or a partnership in business or you identify yourself with a liberal school or a liberal church and join it. But my friend, that's what he has reference to, and he's not talking about this idea today of joining in an evangelistic crusade. There are a lot of men that don't do it the way I do it, and some of them are so much more successful than I am that maybe I'm the one wrong and maybe they're right. But the thing is that I feel like I'm right, and I intend to go along as it is now, but that won't keep me from having fellowship with these men just because they do things a little differently than I do it. They're preaching the same gospel that I preach. They believe the same Bible that I believe. And that's not what Paul is talking about here because he says, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Well, I certainly don't have any part with them. I'm not joined with them permanently in anything. And I trust you are not. But I'm not going to sit in judgment now of some man today that are doing things differently than I do. Now, verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? And now he's talking against idolatry. And certainly we couldn't join with an idolatry. For ye are the temple of the living God, and God hath said, I'll dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. You see, the temple of God today is the human body of a believer. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Wherefore, come out from among them... And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Paul's talking here definitely about idolatry and about infidelity 
and that type of thing, and about joining up with it permanently. Don't be identified with that in a permanent way. Now, to try to articulate this with an evangelistic crusade or with some brother that comes into town and you go and hear him, my friend, may I say to you, that is taking that which comes from the tender heart of a man who has a broken heart and who's being kind and loving and making it as hard as nails And it ought not to be made that way. But we do need to recognize there should be a separation from that which is worldliness today. Now, I have been with men, and I've had the privilege since I've retired of being in over a hundred different churches. And that means that many pastors. And I want to say I've met some lovely, wonderful men in these churches. It's been the most exciting and the most rewarding time of my ministry. And it's been the most fruitful also, by the way. Now, many of these men, I'm with them. I'm with one man, and he has a certain position. He doesn't fellowship with certain ones. And by the way, I don't agree with that man. I think he's being a little too strict. I go to another place where I meet a brother. He's fellowshipping with a whole lot of folk I wouldn't fellowship with. But I'm not going to sit in judgment on either one of these brethren, though I may think that they're wrong, because that's not what Paul's talking about. Now, what Paul's talking about is this matter of worldliness. And today, that spirit has gotten into the church in the heart and life of a lot of believers who say they're separated. It's like when we were in the book of Joshua. You see, when Joshua took Jericho and he took it by faith, God gave that to him. And that's worldliness. Now, we can overcome worldliness by faith. But you see, up yonder at Ai, which seemed to be so easy, Joshua was overcome. He could blow his trumpet around Jericho, but he wasn't able to around Ai. And there are a lot of Christians today, oh my, they talk about how they're separated and they don't do this. Do you know that they're gossipy and they got the meanest tongue? And very candidly, they're very worldly. I found out that they go in for dress, they go in for gluttony and gossip. A lot of those folk go in for that. And they really do things that surprise and shock me. And yet they talk about separation. And I'm not sitting in judgment on them. But my friend, we ought to be very careful when we are talking about the things of God and that the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior and we love him. We're separated unto him when actually we're not separated unto him. I remember when I entered the minister, there was a vice president of the bank who was as godless a man as I've ever met. And he could swear as I've never heard anyone. He called me over to his desk. I think it rather moved him when I announced I was giving up my job and going to study for the ministry. And I think it rather touched him. And he called me into his office and he said, Vernon, I want to tell you a story, and he told me a story. He had a man working for him in another bank during World War I, and he said that that man was as godless and as worldly as he could be. He was a soloist in a church, and he got up one Sunday morning, and this godless vice president was there and listened to him. He got up and he sang about Jesus satisfied. And he knew that Jesus didn't satisfy him. And so a dear lady got up afterward that knew this vice president, said to him, oh, wasn't that a marvelous solo? Sounded just like it came out of heaven. And so this man that worked for him that sang the solo was a teller in the bank. This woman is in doing business, and this teller was attempting to get a balance, and he was off, and he began to rip out oaths began to curse. And this lady was shocked. She said, who is that over there? Why, he says, that's the voice that you thought the other Sunday came out of heaven. And may I say to you, that was the reason that vice president was the skeptic and the rascal that he really was. Why? Because he knew that when a professing Christian said Jesus satisfies, he knew he didn't satisfy him. He knew that that fellow was running around. He knew he was drinking. He knew he was cussing. 
And he knew that if he was a Christian, he wouldn't be doing that sort of thing. And it made this man a cynical individual. And this vice president reached over and touched me on the knee. He says to me, Vernon, don't be a preacher unless you mean it. I've never forgotten that. My friend, don't be a Christian unless you mean it. Don't go around and say Jesus satisfies when he's really not satisfying you. This is what Paul's talking about. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. In other words, you'll be a son and daughter that can honor you, you see. A man told me about his boy going away to college, and the boy got alienated from his dad. He was still his son. But he said to him, I can't deal with him as I would like to as a father. I can't talk to him like I'd like to as a father. God says here, he'll be a father unto you. God wants to be a father to you, friends. And if you're going off into worldliness, and you don't mean what you say, and you're hypocritical in your life, you can be sure of one thing. He can't be a father to you. Oh, you're his son. Don't forget. And you shall be my son. God wants to treat you as a son. doesn't want to everlastingly be taking you to the woodshed. And that is what he means here. Now we come to the seventh chapter of 2 Corinthians. And this is the last chapter under the section of the comfort of God. Now we have God's comfort in the heart of Paul. Now this is very personal. This chapter is... Oh, how personal it is. And then how wonderful it is, by the way. Now, will you notice that? He says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, he's talking here about holy living. And this is so important. He's actually dealing in this chapter, the thing that's motivating what he's saying is the fact that there was a man in the church in Corinth that was guilty of gross immorality. He had an incestuous and an adulterous relationship with his own father's wife, his stepmother, of course. And the church didn't deal with that. Now, Paul says, you don't deal with that. I'm coming over there and I'll deal with it. And they did deal with it. And when they did, this man repented. He confessed his sins. And the church had been accurate in dealing with it. Now, Paul, the letter he wrote, had had the right kind of effect. And when Titus came and reported, he says that this man's been weeping over his sin. He feels utterly unworthy of further recognition. And the church over there is determined now they're going to keep things clean. Now, Paul speaks here, having therefore these promises. Well, now, what promises is he talking about? Well, the ones he's been talking about back in chapter 6. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and be a father unto you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Now, God says... Now, if you will obey me and do this thing, well, God says to you that I'm going to be a real father to you, and you're going to be my sons and daughters, and I can deal with you, therefore. Now, we need to recognize here, how can we cleanse ourselves? He says, let us cleanse ourselves. Well, we cannot cleanse our own conscience from the guilt of sin. God has done that through the death of Christ and the shedding of his blood. I can't wash out the stain even of a guilty conscience. Now, if we've been cleansed from our sins by the blood of Christ, then our hearts need daily cleansing. And that's by faith in the Word which God's given. And when we receive the Word in faith and I act upon it, I cleanse myself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And that's what it means, friends, when the Lord Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The best bar of soap in the world to clean up is the word of God. And it'll really clean you up. He mentions here 
cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Now, is there a difference between the filthiness of the flesh and the filthiness of the spirit? Oh, yes. There are two classes of sin. All sin's filthy in the sight of God, and all sin's filthy. But the filthiness of the flesh, I think, refers to the sins of the body. And then the sins of the spirit, the filthiness of the spirit, are the sins of the spirit. Now, all sin is filthiness, but he divides it here into the filthiness of the flesh and the filthiness of the spirit. Now, what's the difference between the sins of the flesh and the sins of the spirit? When I hear the things that we're to separate ourselves from, and the things actually that he's mentioned, and they're the sins, of course, that we commit in the body, in these bodies of ours. It has to do with unholy lusts, unbridled appetites, drunkenness, gluttony, licentiousness, inordinate affection, lusting today after the wrong things. These are the sins of the flesh. These are the dirty things. And you and I are living in a world today that's giving a respectability to the sins of the flesh. Let me use this illustration. The matter of liquor today. And the Word of God still says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also. God have mercy on you, Christian, if you're serving cocktails in your home. The Word of God rebukes it. Habakkuk 2.15, if you want to know where that is, and in Proverbs 23.31, he says, Look not upon the wine when it's red. And today, we say that alcohol is all right. I heard the other day on the radio and on TV this type of an advertisement. It says, the mark of a mature, sensible, and successful man today is one who's able to drink cocktails. Oh, my friend, what propaganda that is. You talk about brainwashing people. Hitler never did a better job of brainwashing, nor did the communists, than's being done by the liquor interests today. Now, may I say to you that That's the mark of a mature, sensible, and successful man. But wait a minute. You know what that was an advertisement for? It was not for the advertisement of old Southern Comfort or an old crow or some other old bird. It was an advertisement from an organization that deals with alcoholics. Now they added and said, you know, there's some people that just don't know how to handle their liquor. You bet they are. There are a whole lot of them, several millions of them. And we taxpayers are paying the hospital bill that the liquor interests create today. These are sins of the flesh that we're talking about. And then look today at our book stands, filled with the vilest pornographic literature that is imaginable that glorifies the human body and sex. And we have today, as a result, all this permissiveness in sex. God's Word still condemns all of that, you see. Now, these are the sins of the flesh. And my friend, if you go and indulge in them, God can't treat you as a father. Now, you may be his son. I'm not going to argue that with you. But he can't treat you as a father treats his son. Now, he mentions here the filthiness of the Spirit. Now, wait a minute, I may step on somebody's toes now. Oh, I'm not. The Word of God may. What are some of the sins of the Spirit? How about gossip, friends? How about issuing a vicious slander against some Christian brother? You know, there are great many people who won't take a gun and pull the trigger and shoot a man down, but they'll take a dagger of gossip and put it in his back when he's not listening. And some of the dear saints in the church engage in that. And then what about vanity today? Oh, my. I saw a woman that was going to speak to a Bible class. And I've never seen anyone that was so intent on getting her looks or getting her face on, as it were. She put on, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not against makeup. A lady came to me that didn't have any on at all, and she says... 
Donna McGee, she said, do you believe it's sinful to use makeup? And I said, lady, it wouldn't be sinful if you used makeup. I can assure you that because I think all of us Christians ought to look the best we can. Some of us don't have much to work with, but vanity, friends. Oh, what a sin that is. Pride. (laughs) These are the sins of the Spirit. Conceit, haughtiness, unbelief. Oh, these are the dirty sins of the Spirit today. And we got a lot of saints in the church. They wouldn't get drunk. They wouldn't smoke a cigarette either. But, oh, do they have on the end of their tongue, they've got something that burns lots more than any cigarette burns, and that's gossip. Now, I know I'm stepping on toes. We probably ought to move away from that. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, we are to, the writer of the Hebrews says, we are to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, Christ is my righteousness. He's my holiness. But friends, <laughs> my life and his perfection are really far apart. God says, Let's not have such a big generation gap. Let's not have such a big hole in this gap. I want you to be holy. May I say to you, this is a tremendous statement. Now I must move on. He says here, receive us. We've wronged no man. We've corrupted no man. We've defrauded no man. You know, when Paul came in, he didn't take an offering for a bunch of stray cats in the Aleutian Islands. I don't know whether anybody's running that or not, but I'm sure not going to get in that business. We are not to take up offerings for things like that and then use them for something else. And then the deacon board in churches, when an individual gives money for a certain purpose, it's to be used for that. And friends, I know deacon boards that don't follow that. May I say to you, Paul could say, we've corrupted no man, we've defrauded no man. I wish that a great many today Christians could say the same thing. And then he says, I speak not this to condemn you, for I've said before that ye are in our hearts to die and to live with you. Oh, how Paul loved these. Now will you notice what he says here. He says, great is my boldness of speech unto you, Great is my glorying of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joyful in all our trouble. Now, this is quite lovely, and I think we need to have a little background here to understand this, because some of you may have tuned in a little late as we come to this. And we need to recognize that Paul, in his first epistle to the Corinthians, he wrote them a very sharp letter. We've seen that in 1 Corinthians. And I tell you, Paul called them babes in Christ. He called them carnal Christians. And there was gross immorality among them. And he said, that thing, you are to put that away. You are to deal with it. They had dealt with it. And then Titus met him, you will recall, over in Philippi and told him that the church had dealt with it and the man had repented. And then Paul wrote and told him, oh, you're to receive him now because don't go to the opposite extreme and keep him out of your fellowship. Oh, my friends, today we need to recognize that. Now Paul begins to brood over all of this. And Paul says, maybe after all, I shouldn't have written such a sharp letter to you. Maybe I shouldn't have written like that. Maybe I should have come to you directly. And he's turning that over in his mind. Because, you see, when he left Ephesus, he went to Troy, Troas, and he waited there. And Titus didn't come, and he's rebuking himself. And he went on up to Philippi, and that's when Titus came and brought him word at that time. Now, somebody's going to say to me, but I thought you believed in the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures and that Paul was writing by inspiration in 1 Corinthians. Yes, he did. That's the inspired Word of God. I believe that with all my heart. Well, then, how could he rebuke himself? Because he was human. But God had him write like that. And God's having him write like this to let you and me know how human he really is. 
and then how tender and how sweet and loving he was, and that you and I ought to be the same way. (laughs) Oh, what a lesson this is for us. And he says, now that he's received the letter, he says, I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceeding joy for all our tribulation. You know, there may be somebody listening to me today, if you'd sit down and write a certain letter to an individual that maybe you had hurt years ago and Tell them you were sorry and that you wanted to make things right. You know what you'd do for them? You'd make them exceedingly joyful. We need to do that. Verse 5 is very personal now. I feel like we ought to turn our head now and not even read this, because this is very personal. I'm not sure Paul thought at this point that we'd be reading this today. He says, "...for when we were coming to Macedonia..." Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. You see, God used a man to comfort Paul. And you could help some dear saint of God. My friend, when was the last time that you went to your preacher? Put your arm around him, that is, if you're a man, put your arm around him and say, Brother, I've been praying for you. I see you're working pretty hard, and I know you're standing for the things of God, and I just want you to know I'm standing with you. He'd appreciate that. That is, if he's that kind of a preacher. If he's not, then don't do it. But if he is. Now listen to him. God that comforted those that are cast down. He comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation or comfort wherewith he was comforted in you. You comforted Titus, and Titus comforted me. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Somebody came to me the other day, and I was in a church service, and this party came to me and said, My brother, who lives back east, and I call no names or give no places, he said, you know, he wrote me, and we've been praying for him. And he said, you know, I've been listening to that fellow McGee from California. Hope you can meet him sometime and tell him that I have accepted Christ as my Savior. Now, why that brother didn't write me, I don't know, but he didn't. He wrote to his brother out here, and his brother told me. And I want to say that comforted me. Makes me know this radio program, friends, is something I ought to be doing. Listen to him. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. My friends, don't mind saying something nice to somebody. Your tongue won't fall out if you say something nice. Now he says, though I made you sorry with a letter... I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. You see, repentance and shedding of tears are not the same thing. They should go together, but they're not the same thing. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Now listen to this verse. It's an important one. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now what is real repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. Now God, as far as I can tell, the only repentance he asks of the lost is in the word believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What happens when you believe? Well, listen to Paul. Writing to the Thessalonians, he says, How ye turn to God from idols. That was a change of mind. Now, how did it work? They first turned to Christ. Paul came. He didn't come and preach against idolatry. He preached Christ. And when he preached Christ to them, They turned to Christ, but say they were idolaters. Now, when they turned to Christ in faith, what happened? Well, they turned from idols, and that turning from idols was repentance. Now, that's for the unsaved. 
I don't know whether God wants us to emphasize repentance to the unsaved. He wants us to emphasize Christ. But for believers, he says to them to repent. That is, if they go in the wrong direction. Now, a lot of people shed tears, but they don't mean it. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world. That's what works death, you see. Sorrow of the world. My dad used to tell about a boat on the Mississippi River that when it was going upstream, this boat had a little bitty boiler and a great big whistle. And when they would blow the whistle going upstream, the boat would start drifting downstream because the boiler was so small it couldn't blow the whistle. The whistle was too big for the boat. Now, today, there are a lot of folk that have got a great big whistle and a little bitty boiler. They'll shed tears But they don't repent, really. They just shed tears. And they keep going the same direction. And a lot of folk, they got a big whistle. They cry a lot. But doesn't mean anything. And the thief, he wept when they caught him. But he didn't weep because he was a thief. He wept because they caught him. Now listen. He says, For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, Yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation. And he goes on to commend them for the fact that they really turned to God. Now, this was repentance for believers. There are a lot of believers today that need to repent. Now, he says, verse 13, Therefore we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I'm not ashamed. And then let me drop down to the last verse of this chapter, verse 16. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. Paul just opens up his heart here, doesn't he? He's very, very personal. Here is God's comfort in the heart of Paul. What a lesson for us today.